Ka tangi te titi, ka tangi te kaka, ka tangi hoki aho, tihei mauri ora, ro rangatira ma e hui mai nei, tena koutou. Ko Ian Griffin aho. Um, welcome to the Otago Museum on a very special night for us when we've got um, some very special guests. Um, before we get into the main um, discussion this evening, I do have a few safety announcements to make. Um, if there is an earthquake, please stay still until it finishes and then leave through the door that you entered. Um, there are one set of toilets in operation this evening and they're through the back door. Um, my job is to introduce um, the speakers tonight. Um, as you all know, the museum's been running an exhibition called Challenging the Deep, which explores some of the amazing science and research and um, exciting imagery that um, James Cameron has uh, achieved during his career as a filmmaker and as an explorer. And it's ironic, really, in a week which for me is all about exploration. It start, um, a team from our museum started the week on the beach at Fitianga, watching a transit of Mercury uh, in the same place that Cook and Green saw one and the Endeavour in 1769. The week's going to end with a real proper live explorer sharing his wonders uh, with us here in Dunedin. So that's enough from me. I'm now going to hand over to Noel McCarthy from Radio New Zealand, who is going to be our host for this evening. And this evening is going to be broadcast on Radio New Zealand on the 1st of December at 4 o'clock. And she will be in discussion with a very special guest of the museum, uh, James Cameron. So I'd like to invite you all to welcome them in a true traditional Dunedin way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for that welcome, and I'd like to start by, um, by acknowledging the mana whenua of this place where we're in. He mihi tene kina iwi mana whenua, moiraki, pukateraki, otako, hokanui. And welcome to you all. Welcome to our event tonight here at Otago Museum. What a pleasure it is to introduce our guest. As a writer and a filmmaker, it's no hyperbole to say he has redefined the medium, the medium of cinema, from the abyss to Avatar, Terminator to Titanic. These are stories designed with wonder and awe in mind. Stories created while their maker was sometimes developing the technology to tell these stories, even as the cameras were rolling. Talk about building the plane while you're flying it. But the films are only part of the story. That same visionary design sensibility and that genius for innovation has also been applied to his passion for exploring our oceans. As you'll know if you've been around the exhibition upstairs, it is a testament to a remarkable career as an underwater explorer and an exhibition leader and an extraordinary commitment to curiosity a commitment to problem solving, to pushing the boundaries of design technology, to leadership and teamwork, and all with the aim of exploring the last frontiers of our planet. He's an artist, an explorer, an environmentalist, a consistent innovator, someone who doesn't seem to have ever heard the phrase, no can do, and his fields of endeavor are all the richer for it. Please join me in welcoming James Cameron. Thank you. Thank you. That was very kind. Now I know you're going to get rough on me. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of hard questions. No. Well, when I was visiting the exhibition upstairs and I came to the, um, to the trench, I thought about the mountaineer George Mallory. And I thought about what he said when they asked him, mm -hmm. why Everest? Because it's there. Yeah. Same for you? Well, I think, I think there are mysteries out there. I mean, the universe is filled with mysteries and we're gonna be exploring those mysteries for the next million years or whatever, because human beings are, we're curious monkeys, mm -hmm. we're you know, curious hominins, and we have to know what's over, the, what's over the hill. Some people have it stronger than others. And uh, you know, Don Walsh, who's the other, uh, the, you know, the guy who went down in 1960 was Jacques Picard to, to the Challenger Deep. Uh, and is a, is a friend of mine, 
and he says that, um, that exploration is just curiosity acted upon. So some people are curious and they want to know, but they don't act upon it to go and find out. And uh, I've, I've just always wanted to sort of, you know, sure, push, the, push the boundaries with technology and that sort of thing. That's the enabler that gets mm -hmm. you there. But it's also just wanting to go. I call it bearing witness. You go to bear witness. You go to see it, and you you act as a kind of um, uh, really conduit for that experience to the rest of the world. So, as a filmmaker, you innately want to tell a story. You come back and you tell the story. Well, that's that, that's a really important part of your story, the 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 human experience right. as part of these expeditions, because. You're gathering information, but it's not just about the data for you, is yeah, it? Yeah, no, no, it's about the narrative. And I think that's a good thing because scientists traditionally, and I know some very good communicators you know, who are scientists, but traditionally they either shun it because they don't want the scrutiny or they don't want to you know, have the sort of the Carl Sagan effect, which can, mm -hmm. unless you're Carl Sagan, it can tend to taint your career mm -hmm. as a, a scientist. Or they're just not good at it. You know, they're really good at their investigation and their, and their work and they live a life of the mind, but they're not good communicators. Um, there are exceptions and we need to, to have more of those exceptions because we really need people that can speak for science and for investigation, research and, and exploration. You know, I mean, I think metaphorically you can be exploring a new microbe in a lab, but mm. to me, exploration is going someplace yeah. and going someplace new and seeing something new. I see there's a lot of young people in the audience and you say, people ask you, why go? And you often say, children would never no, ask that No, question. you know, I mean, I think, you know, people ask, you know, why, why did you want to build a sub and, and dive to the deepest spot in the ocean? And I've never gotten that question from a seven-year-old. <laughs> Because the seven-year-old would say, well, why wouldn't you want to build a sub and go, <laughs> go to the deepest spot in the ocean? I want to go, mm. right? How old are you guys? You're, you're nine. nine. Do you want to build a sub and go to the deepest part of the ocean? Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Case in point. <laughs> right. Yeah. Keeping that sense of wonder alive, though, as time goes yeah, by. Yeah, it's hard. It is a discipline, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, then reality sets in, and it's like, how hard is that going to be? What materials yeah. do you need? How are you going to compose your team? Yeah. What engineering hurdles are you going to have? Um, fortunately, I, I find it therapeutic to solve hard engineering problems. When I'm working on Same. a... Same. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that in you. Um, no, but, I mean, you know, I'm working on a film, and it's kind of, there's... Hmm. there's you know, there's a million things going on in a movie. It can be an enormous amount of pressure. My mind tends to go to an engineering problem to get away from it. Soothing. So, yeah, some people just, just you know, have a Chardonnay and, and <laughs> watch Netflix, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'm not saying I don't do that too, but I, mm. I prefer to solve an engineering problem. Which explains so much about the trajectory of your art, doesn't it? I mean, the abyss mm -hmm. is upstairs as part of that story. You were developing the technology that you needed to tell that story as yeah. you were telling it. It was a, the, the abyss, um, which turns, turned 30 in August, yeah. believe it or Happy not. Birthday. 30 years ago I was making that film. It was a real turning point for me because a couple of things happened on that movie. I got to meet a lot of my kind of heroes who were real explorers, like Dr. Robert Ballard and some of the robotics uh, engineers at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, which is kind of the, the US equivalent to NIWA you know, and, and the, the, the deep ocean research that they do here. Uh, Woods Hole is the US version of that. I got to meet the people who actually build this stuff. And so I went from making a science fiction movie where I was imagining subs and vehicles and so on to the people who actually do it. And so that was the first step down the path toward the possibility of actually doing it myself, working with these guys and really doing deep ocean exploration. The other thing that happened on the abyss is there's a little scene, if you've ever seen the movie, there's a little scene in the middle of the film that has a completely computer generated character, a soft surface character that makes faces and so on. It's, it's l sort of living water. And it was a huge, huge breakthrough uh, in its time. And I called it dreaming with your eyes wide open to see something like that that seems so mm. impossible, very surreal. And that was another big turning point for me because I saw 
that you could actually entertain by showing people something that they had previously only seen in their own imagination or in their dreams. Where did it live in your mind? You know, if it hadn't been seen before, if it hadn't been in the world before? Oh, um, yeah, that's a good point, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder that about a lot of your films. Well, dream imagery, yeah. you know. I mean, look, our, our dreams are just the brain kind of mashing things up and putting ideas together and constantly just painting this ongoing picture or telling this story all night long. You know, some people don't remember them, some people do. I get a lot of story ideas from dreams. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're very surreal, sometimes they're disturbing, but then I start to, I start to connect the dots and put characters into it and, and turn them into movies. Terminator came from a dream yes, in Italy, I think, is that right? Yes, done your research, yeah, absolutely. That image of a, of a steel skeleton emerging from a fire, that came straight out of a dream, and then I just built a story around that mm. picture. And there's a theme here, isn't there, of the braiding of the real, of mm -hmm. things from nature, mm -hmm. organic shapes or anatomy, yeah. Yeah. with technology, with things that hadn't yet sure. existed. I think braiding is a really interesting term. I was flying in and, and you know, as I was flying down here looking at the braided rivers in the mm. Canterbury Plain and just really thinking about how these are different streams that just constantly cross each other. And that's kind of the effect I get when I walk through the exhibit here. I see how the art and the narrative storytelling interwove with the technical development to make either the movies possible or the documentaries of the of the deep expeditions possible. The two, the two worked t together beautifully. Mm. Uh, I, I thought, you know, when I see it all in retrospect, I don't think that was the big plan. Big plan was just go take a look, you know. <laughs> Again, it all boils down to ex ex exploration, I mean, to curiosity. That's what drives exploration. It's lovely that we're doing this, that we're having this conversation in front of an audience in a museum because about your, your deep ocean work, yeah. because I believe it was a visit to a museum in Toronto hmm. where, where you started. saw where it all started. Can you tell us about that? Well, I've got a good friend. He's in his, in his 80s now, Dr. Joe McGuinness, but he was one of Canada's leading oceanographers, if not the leading oceanographer. This was back in the 70s. And... Um, for fun, I used to go to museums and, and sketch. And uh, when I was about 14, so that would have been 69 or 70, um, I was at the Royal Ontario Museum and there was a, a, a display, a big vehicle was on display out in front of the museum. And I walked around it and I, I sort of understood innately what it was. It was it had a big ballast weight at the bottom and a platform and it had a kind of dome windows and, and it was entered through uh, through the bottom. It was an underwater habitat and it was built by Dr. Joseph McGinnis. So I did some sketches of it and they're actually in the, they're in the uh, exhibit space. Did some sketches of it and then I thought, I'm going to contact this guy. So I wrote him a letter. How old were you? 14 or 15, something right. like that. I'm going to contact, I want to build one of these. So actually, so then I started thinking about how I would build my own and I thought, I don't know where you get the windows. So I, I wrote him a letter, and it was, you know, <laughs> Dr. McGinnis, I'm building my own sublimnos. His thing was called sublimnos. I'm building my own underwater habitat, and I'm going to get in it. Um, what do you use for windows? <laughs> and he sent me back specific... Great question, to yeah. the point. Yeah, yeah, he actually sent me back the specifications for the particular type of acrylic that was used for the windows of the sublimnos and how I could get them. So I, I wrote to the uh, Rom and Haas, the acrylic company, and they sent me a sample, about a you know, foot and a half square of, of one inch acrylic. And I thought, oh, I'm half done. I've got my window. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I contacted him years later. And he actually has come out with me on a, a couple of the expeditions and uh, actually written books about, uh, mm. about the expeditions. But his, his fascination is leadership. And I'm always struggling to be a better leader. Uh, because I think it's critical when you're, when you're doing things with small teams, and I definitely recommend small teams for, for um, uh, engineering design and for building new vehicles and prototypes and things like that, because you sit around in a room with, with a handful of, of really smart people, and it's fun and it's exciting mm -hmm. and the ideas are flowing. When it turns into the, the big mega projects, it, it just breaks down in bureaucracy and creativity kind of just dies.
they're really smart and they're, and they're the people, as you say, but they're from a range of different disciplines, yeah, aren't yeah. there? That's a really interesting aspect of the work you've been doing in the ocean, isn't it? How that sure. can disciplinary. I mean, when, when we built the Deep Sea Challenge vehicle, the, the guy that designed the batteries had only worked on buses, <laughs> electric buses. <laughs> and there was a, 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 a young guy who was, you know, basically had just gotten his PhD, I think, in electronics and was doing robotics, but it was all dry land robotics. He had never worked on a sub, he had never been to sea, he had never been underwater. He wound up coming out on the expedition <laughs> <laughs> and holding on to the railing most of the time. But, you know, I wanted the people who actually built the vehicle to come, with, to come out with us. So I, I figured it was easier to, to, to teach these guys how to survive on a ship at sea than to uh, try to explain to some, some seasoned sea dog how to fix the electronics inside the, the brain of the vehicle. On that, incidentally, how long do you think it takes to get your sea legs? I mean, did it take you a long time to get yours? Well, it depends on what drugs you take. <laughs> 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 I tend to have a stomach. I mean, if you could, there's some people that have an absolute cast iron stomach, and then you could, you could spin them around 100 times, and it doesn't even affect them. And then other people throw up just watching the ocean, right? Mm -hmm. I'm about dead center. Which means that if I if you get a C state much much above a Beaufort you know four or so I'm I'm taking something, but I think that's kind of a tribute to the to the drive and the curiosity and mm -hmm. so on. I don't let a little thing like like puking over the railing keep me from being an ocean explorer. <laughs> you know, it's like that's just a detail. There's something that's almost feels in retrospect at least fated about this relationship between you and the ocean. I mean, upstairs, it says on the exhibition, you'll have seen it, it says, it's a quote from you, I was in love with the ocean before we ever met. Yeah. That's very romantic. <laughs> yeah, it sounds, I think that's true. I mean, it was, uh, you guys are probably too young to have heard of a guy named Jacques Cousteau. Mm -hmm. You know who Jacques Cousteau is? Yeah, have the you seen The Life there. Aquatic? Right. Maybe? So obviously the first of the, yeah. of the great telegenic explorers that really know, knew how to use this new medium of television and bring the deep ocean, the wonders of the ocean, not even that deep, they weren't going that deep, but the wonders of the ocean into the, the living rooms of the world. And he did an enormous amount to get people excited about the oceans in the 60s and the 70s. And at first it was just look at all the cool stuff. And then it became about, we have to protect this. Because mm -hmm. he was even then starting to see degradation of the reefs and populations that were, you know, of, of animals that were at risk. So he was my example as a, as a teenager. You know, I wanted to be like him. I wanted to live on that ship. Mm -hmm. But I lived landlocked, uh, you know, 400 miles from the ocean. I learned to scuba dive in a pool and my first open water dive was in a river, you know, in Canada. So I, it, was, it was even a couple of years after that that I first did my first open water dives in the, in the actual ocean. That must have been a revelation to you. Oh, it was. It was amazing. Do you remember it? Oh, clearly. Absolutely clearly. Yeah, crystal clear. And there have been many, many dives since then, but that one is still crystal clear in your memory. Y yeah, yeah. The fr I think your first dive and your first few dives, you know, remain such burned in memories because it's such an overwhelming experience to suddenly be able to fly freely in a three-dimensional environment and to see these animals that, that live there. Even if you've been a free diver, your first scuba dives, I think, mm -hmm. have, that, have that impact. But, um, and uh, you know, of course, thousands of hours later and having sp also spent thousands of hours filming underwater, like for movies, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's now it's so second nature, I, I don't even think about it. And, and there are different, emotions and different histories associated with the different parts of the ocean that you've been to. I mean, Titanic mm. is a part of our collective history, a monument to hubris well, for, you, for many people. Um, even for you growing up, I guess, in, in Ireland, Cork, yeah. which is near Cobe, where the t last Titanic last saw land as it, as it steamed away from the Irish coast. Um, yeah, and I think that's something that's in our collective consciousness, Titanic is the quintessential example of pride goeth before a fall, hubris, you know. And I think we're liver, living in a very hubristic time right now where we think that our, 
our, the power of our mind and our technology is going to save us from anything that, that comes along. And uh, when in fact it's going to take a lot of hard decisions to get through the crises that are of our own making. And I think we all, we all know what they are. Mm. And I'll come back to that because that's an important strand in, in your work. But just to go back to Cousteau, in a way, that narration of the experience, mm -hmm. that bringing back of the idea, tell me about that impulse as it related to Titanic. What was it like when you came up from that first dive? It's interesting, my first dive at Titanic, um, I was very cold and calculating, like an astronaut trying to accomplish the mission. I had things I had to do, and I didn't allow myself to open emotionally while I was on the mm. dive. I got back to my cabin on the, on the Russian research ship after I'd spent 16 hours in the submersible, and I sat down, and it all flooded back, and I realized I had been sitting in a sub on the deck of the ship right where the band played, right by the first class entrance on the on the port side near lifeboat eight or lifeboat six. And it just all flooded back and, and uh, I was kind of overwhelmed by emotion at that point. And then I, I kind of made, I mean, I you know, literally was tearing up thinking of the tragedy and the people because I didn't go there without having studied the history of it very carefully in planning for the expedition. So then I thought, I have to always remind myself to be present you know, just be present, just be there, just bear witness. That's where I came up with the idea. So I literally, typically, would write it into my, into my instructions to myself for the dive. Stop, look, you know, and then do this and then do that, you know. I think Willie Nelson has something, a maxim. He says, wherever you are, be there. Be there. Yeah. Be there. Be there. Yeah. And because you're never going to be there again. You know, and you do, I think as a filmmaker, certainly, or as a, as a writer, you have a responsibility to come back and tell the story to others, because we can't all get in a sub and go down to Titanic. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's, a, and I think I tend to be very aware of that responsibility in the moment, which is why I'm running the 3D cameras and I'm struggling to get the shot and I'm talking the whole time and laying it down on tape so that it's all, it's all there. So I think you become a kind of a hum human conduit for the experience for everybody else that, that doesn't get to make that dive. Well, they're massively complementary in that way, aren't they? Aren't they both of those enterprises? Mm -hmm. Because as a director, telling a story with a human heart, it must be very important to be present. To be yeah, you have to not only be present yourself, but you have to, you have to be able to shift your, your consciousness into the, to the mind of the actor as well and be in touch with, with their emotions and if it's multiple characters in the, in the scene. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and, and actors are the, are the great professionals at being present. They are nothing if not present. They're mm -hmm. right there, you know, just all raw, raw emotion. And we could all take a, a lesson from that ability to kind of switch that on and connect. You know, mm -hmm. if you watch two actors working, you see it in every movie, the, their eyes are moving over each other's faces at, at this kind of high rate you know, it's an almost heightened state of awareness. I don't act, but I work with actors, obviously, mm. all the time. Did you make the film as the quickest way of getting back <laughs> to the boat? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, sure. <laughs> we made, I made Titanic so that I could go dive Titanic. Yeah. <laughs> and then we made some money with Titanic, so then we just went and did it some more. <laughs> And the process developed, you know, deep ocean stereoscopic camera systems and small robotic vehicles that would spool a fiber optic so that they could, they could go and explore in, in very complicated uh, small spaces and so on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we developed a whole bunch of new systems to do that. Is that why it's a love story? I'm, I'm really interested in that tension mm -hmm. between the emotional and the technological. You know, this is the grand love story of Jack and Rose. Yeah. But the first image in, in the film is an image of machines, isn't it? Or the first yeah. scene is those submersibles beeping th in the darkness. I think, you know, uh, I had sort of a bit of a reputation as a technical director at that point, meaning, you know, innovation and technology, the CG stuff, Terminator 2, True Lies, mm -hmm. things like that that were big, big action films. And I, 
there was this sense in Hollywood, I think it still exists, that you can be a humanistic filmmaker or you can be a technical filmmaker, but you can't be both. And I think one of the things that appealed to me about Titanic was to show that you can use the technology to tell a story, and if you've done it right, it disappears. Mm. And all you care about is the people. Steven Spielberg didn't buy that. I mean, he said you're an emotional director, you're <laughs> a teller. Some of you will know the, the series of conversations that I'm talking about, um, James Cameron's story of science fiction, which I've spent far too much time watching. But it's, it's but interviews. But they're cool interviews. Yeah. I mean, to, uh, it was such a dream for me to get to talk to these guys. I knew most of them, but to really get them to open up about their art and their thought process. He said E.T. wasn't a story of an alien. It's a story of a young boy whose parents are getting divorced. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So you, you, no matter what a story appears to be about, if it's about robots or time travel or outer space or whatever, it's really about us and some universality of human interaction, relationship. I always say all my movies are love stories. Mm. You know, Aliens is a love story. It's a love story between a woman who's lost a daughter and the daughter that she sort of takes on to protect. And so it's a maternal, maternal love story. Mm. The love stories can be on, I call them axes, the axis between the two characters. Love stories can be on all kinds of axes. Titanic was the classic love story in the Romeo and Juliet boy meets girl kind of, kind of mm. way. That's how I pitched it, by the way. I took this beautiful painting of Titanic sinking all lit up with the lifeboats going away, just kind of almost you know, elegantly beautiful in, 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 as, it, as it was sinking. And I set it on the, the coffee table at the head of 20th Century Fox's office, and I said, Romeo and Juliet, there. So what is it? Romeo and Juliet, there, four words. Mm -hmm. Raised $130 million with four words. Green light. Because <laughs> they got it. They were like, wow, that's great. You know? But something so, else. To their credit, they actually got it. <laughs> they usually don't, by the way. <laughs> something else that defines your, your films, though, and you and George Lucas had a conversation about this. Mm, on that you know, it, it, they're talking about, if you can imagine, just the joy of creating worlds, and, and George Lucas is saying to you, isn't it great? You can do whatever you want. But in your films, laws apply. Yeah. The laws of thermodynamics apply, the laws of gravity and motion, they all apply. Right. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I think it's important when you're building a world that people want to invest in, in terms of their time and their energy, uh, whether it's Game of Thrones or whatever, uh, or you know, Avatar, the world of Pandora, is that it, it has to be internally consistent. It has to have some kind of a rule set. Even if it's got floating mountains, there has to be a rule set. And uh, I think that's fundamental to, to creating a great work of fantasy, that it's not just a lot of sporadic kind of surreal imagery, that it actually it has a kind of consistency to it. So for Avatar, for example, we created a culture. We created the Navi culture with a language and, and with a set of behaviors that were consistent with a belief system and so on. Not all of it made it into the film. In fact, only a small fraction did, but we knew it. And so what surfaced in the film, even though it was just the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, mm. all looked like it belonged there. And do you think an audience needs that, responds to that authenticity? I think if you look at the, at the, the fantasy works, whether they're, whether they're literary or whether they're film mm. that have endured, you know, maybe Lord of the Rings would be a great example. There's, um, there's a degree of detail and there's a degree, a degree of kind of rightness to what you're seeing, that it all seems to be of that same, mm. same fabric. Tolkien called it um, the distant mountains. So you don't go to the distant mountains, but they're always there. You know, they kind of surround it. So the mm. specific narrative is surrounded by a kind of a greater uh, bit of storytelling. And, and that's what takes a lot of the work. I think in writing the new Avatar films, I know we're getting off from exploration, but it's cool. Um, <laughs> the, the, writing the new Avatar films, I spent a year just making notes. Just making notes. And the, on day one with, the, with my writer's group, I handed them 1,400 pages of notes about the world and the mm. cultures and the animals and all that sort of thing. And we, that's where we started. That's where our blank page started. <laughs> 14,000 words later, or pages later. But it circles back to exploration, doesn't it? Sure. Because it is that world that 
that exists in the oceans, for sure. example. Sure, and it all it all makes sense, and it all interconnects, and it's up to it's up to human science to explore those connections and see why things are the way they are. And sometimes things are just very enigmatic and puzzling. And sometimes you just have this bonanza of new information. When they discovered the hydrothermal vents back in the, mm. in the late 70s, they literally discovered an entirely new way for things to live. Everything that had ever been seen previously was essentially living on sunlight or the things that were produced by sunlight, plant materials and so on, which would then decay and feed bacteria and fungi and all that sort of thing. But it all was powered by the sun. Then they went down and found hydrothermal vents where there were entire animal communities that had nothing to do with the sun. The sun could go out. And they wouldn't know for quite a while. It was all driven by the heat energy of the earth, heating up water and bringing chemicals to the, up in, uh, you know, into that environment. And then they learned to live off these chemicals that would kill us almost instantly. Hydrogen sulfide is extremely toxic. These things are living on hydrogen sulfide. And yet they have the same kind of DNA, the same kind of cell structure that we have. But it was just nature putting the pieces together in a completely different way. And then that blew the doors off the possibilities for where you could find life on Earth and mm. in the solar system. Well, yes, you know, growing up, you were the era of Cousteau, but you were also the era of the space race. That's right. Yeah. Could it have gone the other way for you, do you think? I was fascinated by space, and, and uh, I, th I think I would have been perfectly happy to, to spend time going into space, but it seemed like there wasn't as much of an important story there. Mm -hmm. We were mostly, we were mostly just sort of going around the Earth really fast, bouncing off walls in mm. microgravity and trying to think up excuses for science in microgravity, which is of micro importance, mm. versus the ocean from which life emerged that keeps us alive, that moderates our temperature, that moderates our carbon cycle and our hyd hydrological cycles and so on. And so much of, our, of life on Earth is dependent on the ocean and we know so little about it and there's such a disproportion in spending. I kind of turn my spotlight on on the ocean, so you know, so to speak. You were down there on your own, in the furthest steps of the ocean. If I had somebody there with me, it wouldn't have helped if that sphere had imploded. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> so. well, but, but as a moment of solitariness. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, what was it like? It's, I think there's something really um, interesting, almost spiritually, about mm -hmm. being alone in such a remote place. I'm sure it might have felt like that to, uh, you know, Neil Armstrong stepping mm. out onto the moon and looking up and seeing the earth from so far away before, you know, Buzz Aldrin got out, hung out with him on the surface mm. there. Um, it it kind of gives you a sense of, of, first of all, being connected to everything. Secondly, a kind of awe at the scope of, of the world that hasn't been seen and hasn't been explored. Because I know I'm looking at a place that nobody's ever seen, no human eyes have ever seen. And then there's the responsibility to, to try to, to communicate that. But you do feel blessed in that moment. And uh, you know, there's a, there's a book called Deep Survival. It's a very interesting book. It was written by a guy, I think his name is David Gonzalez. And it's about a whole bunch, a number of people that survived against almost impossible odds, usually by themselves, from plane crashes, being lost in the mountains, all kinds of bad stuff happened to them. Every, he tried to find the common thread, like what, what is the survivor? What is the common thread? They were all different. He couldn't put the pieces together and he found the one thing that they all had in common, the one thing, was that at some point in their trial where they were virtually certain that they were gonna die in a horrible way, like starving or freezing or whatever it was, they felt that they were in the place they were supposed to be. And they were supposed to be seeing and experiencing what they were seeing. Mm -hmm. And that it was the greatest gift they ever had. And they all had that. So I'm thinking that exploration is like that. You, when you're in that moment, when you're present, you believe you're where you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And you're supposed to be there seeing it. I don't mean in some divine way necessarily, but that there's something that resonates with kind of who you are in the space that you're in that you've put yourself in by, by choice, which is the difference, of course. All those deep survival stories were about mm. people that, they didn't choose to get blown out of an airplane that was breaking up and 
wind up sitting in an airplane seat in the middle of the jungle in the Amazon. That's a bad thing. They didn't choose it. Not a great day at the office. Not a great day at the (laughs) office. (laughs) But that question of perspective is an interesting one to explore. How does that feed in? Because you'd have been going from this work into your other work, right? Yeah. Into into Hollywood, into everything that comes with that. Yeah, yeah. And I think think challenge is a part of it and wanting to challenge oneself. Mm. You know, uh, I think... I don't want to say an impossible task, but a difficult task. Difficult problems are interesting. Mm. And I like to surround myself with people who are fascinated by, by difficult problems. Because you get this amazing kind of team sort of spirit that comes from that. It's a, it's a bond. Mm. We're solving something together. And there's a certain kind of person that likes to do hard stuff. Because nobody else has done it. You know, it's a way of, you know, proving yourself, I guess. When did you first know you were that kind of person? I think when I got all the other kids on my block to help me build an airplane. <laughs> it didn't fly, it didn't fly. We hung it from a tree, but we built an airplane yeah. and got in it at the age of seven or whatever, you know. And thinking about you as a young person, the, the other aspect of that story about going to see the submersible, it was your mom who... who took you out of school for the day. Yeah. You wagged school, as yeah. we say in New Zealand, yeah. to go and see the <laughs> submersible. Yeah. Well, my mother was, was very encouraging about uh, you know, painting and drawing, all the things, and my curiosity. And she, like, we thought it was cool when I was probably 10 to sign up for a college geology class at night and go, and go learn about rocks, to just do that together. That was like my idea of a good time when I was 10 years old. So you can tell I was a geekosaurus, uh, you know. Um, But she encouraged that. So she encouraged that curiosity and acting upon the curiosity. So I would like to hope that the people who act on their curiosity are gonna come here to this museum and they can check out this exhibit, but then they can wander around and see all the other Mm -hmm. amazing stuff here too. It's important to have those people who believe in you though, isn't it? I mean, that that thread of mentorship is running through your story. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's just, uh, it's just the people that um, think you can actually accomplish something. You know, I mean, I, I remember that now. I've got, I've got five kids of my own, and I'm, I'm, you know, I don't want to tell them it's going to be easy, but I do want to tell them they have the capacity. They have the capacity to do it, and they have the capacity to do whatever they want to do, and they're much more likely to do the thing that they want to do and care about. And you know, my, my wife Susie started a school in California, which is based on the principle of passion-based learning. So the teachers have to ask the children what it is they want to do, and then it's the teacher's job to figure out how to get the math and the science and the history and everything to somehow relate to being a skateboarder. Mm. But they do it. They do it, and the kids get to follow their, follow their passion, and, and along the way, they learn the history of California or comparative religion or, or trigonometry or whatever it is, along the way, you know. And it's, it's really much more the way kind of life works for the, for the human mind. You had a teacher, didn't you, who told you you had boundless potential, unlimited potential. Yeah, there was, so my, my high school biology teacher encouraged us to start a theater arts program at my high school, which was a very athletics-based high school. There was absolutely zero bandwidth there for anything to do with the arts or, or, or sciences. If you weren't the captain of the football team, you were, you were nobody, right? Mm. But this guy said, you know, maybe you should start a theater arts program. So we did. We, I, we just got a bunch of kids together, and we just did it on our own time, and we built sets, and we put on plays. We wrote plays, put them on, hijacked all the lighting and audiovisual equipment in the school, and, and basically ran wild. And it's still there. It's still one of the best theater arts programs in the, in the, whole, in the whole district. But um, he came up to me in the hallway one day, and he said, you know, you have unlimited potential. <laughs> and walked away. <laughs> and it actually was really empowering, because, you know, when you're a kid... Did teen- he mean you specifically, you, James Cameron, have unlimited potential, or, or one has? Yeah, no, I, no, he meant me. He meant you. He meant me. <laughs> he, he'd, he'd seen me in action, you know, already, bossing everybody around. But... Uh, you know, he didn't explain it, he just said it and, and kind of walked away. Mm. But 
I, I think it's so important to tell kids that they can, they can do it and, uh, you know, that you can act on your dreams mm -hmm. and that something can actually come of it that could be pretty amazing. Did but you've got to work hard at it, though. That's the thing. Did he get in touch, you know, after Titanic or Avatar? And I, say, you I, wanted it? To, I wanted to call, call him up and thank him, and I found out that he had, mm. had died, unfortunately, quite young. Mm. Yeah, sad, but anyway, he was... Uh, but it, it shows you, I mean, I don't know, some of you may be teachers or, or in a mentorship kind of, kind of role. It's really important what you say and how you encourage and guide and, and shape kids because they're, I'm sure you know from your own childhood, you're just so impressionable at that age. Mm. You talk about, you know, big problems and difficult problems yeah. and I imagine your exploration work has brought you into direct contact with the consequences of one of the most difficult existential problems we are currently looking at as, as a species. Yeah, yeah, it's the Anthropocene era and the, and the sixth great mass extinction, which we are actually, this time around, we are the comet. Mm. You know, the dinosaurs got nuked by, a, by an asteroid or a comet, this time we're the comet. And the consequences to nature is, are gonna be about the same uh, if we don't change. And so far, we're really doing relatively little if you really look at the, at the big picture. I think there are a lot of people of good conscience who are changing the way they live and act and so on. We're just going to need a whole lot, whole lot more of that. Um, but it, it is an existential threat, I think, if, if not to our species actually going extinct. Certainly extinct. Certainly our way of life will be threatened. And, uh, you know, so we've got to act on it. And it's daunting, you know. And, and how, do you, how do you empower people? How do you give them something to mm. do? Because I think that otherwise people tune out. If you don't give them something to do that makes them feel good about themselves and that, they, that we can make a difference. And so, people, and then, so then people always say, all right, what can I do? And I tell them, and they don't want to do it. <laughs> Because the biggest thing you can do actually as an individual is just change what you eat. It has an enormous effect on ecosystems, on di you know, biodiversity loss, uh, rainforest, water pollution, and uh, you know, climate, greenhouse forcing, all of those things has an enormous impact. And we'll talk about this more tomorrow. We yeah. have another talk tomorrow um, here with, with Aaron. Um, but, but one of the things we will talk about tomorrow is that tension between the need for individual action, as yep. you say, whether it's changing your diet, you know, changing what we do, but also the need for multilateral action. This is a global problem, yep. isn't it? That's, see, this is the big problem, is that it, it, right now the trend lines are going the wrong direction. You've got isolationism, you've got these, these populist governments that are sort of closing their mm -hmm. doors, you've got trade wars, you've got, you know, international cooperation is, is ebbing at a time when it needs to be stronger than ever. And so this is, the, this is the thing that we really have to work on. The thing that's so insidious about climate change is that it, it's caused everywhere and it affects everywhere, mm -hmm. which means that all nations, all cultures around the world have to work together to solve it. Typically, we're not good at that. <laughs> And the more isolationist and the more, the more you have populist leadership that emphasize differences and create an us versus them mentality and build walls and, you know, and, and believe in their own exceptionalism you know, as, a, as a culture or as a nation or whatever it is, the harder it's going to be to solve these, you know, this, this huge multilateral problem. Mm. And we live in an age of polarization as yes, well. Yes, exactly. Don't we? when, right. when, what's been your experience, you know, at, the getting to these frontiers, getting to the next level, it's all about cooperation, isn't yeah, it? Exactly. You can't do it on your own. No, you have to cooperate. I mean, you see it at a team level, whether it's a, a film set or whether it's a, a, com a computer animation team mm. or whether it's an engineering team that are trying to build something or whether it's a team at sea under the very hard conditions trying to operate something and make it happen. You get like-minded people who have a goal and they work together. There's no better feeling in the world. Joe McGinnis, the guy I mentioned earlier, he's written a lot of books on, on leadership. He calls it team genius. The people aren't necessarily geniuses. The, the team as a whole is a genius. 
the team figures it out, figures out how to do something that they maybe even thought was impossible when they, when they went into it. Because one person will take up the slack and, or bring in a new idea and then everybody mm. will act on it together. How did that idea for an upright submersible go down initially? <laughs> you know, just talking about that. Um, I don't know. I was just sitting with a couple of people on the, on the research ship on another expedition talking about, all right, well, what's the problem? You gotta get, you gotta get down through a seven mile water column. We knew enough about submersible operations to know that you really ever explore horizontally only about a half mile or a mile maybe at the most. All right, so it's seven miles down, one mile horizontal, seven miles back up, so 14 to one ratio. Which way do you wanna be the most hydrodynamically efficient? Vertically. So then I just drew a vertical torpedo. I said, that's what you gotta build. <laughs> and everybody's like, "Yeah, let's build it." Did they? And did they come from a from a film background, from an Not engineering at all. background? No, they were. Uh, one was a Titanic historian. The other one was a jet propulsion uh, laboratory uh, astrobiologist. And uh, there were a couple of robotics engineers. This was just like our little group on the research ship, just spitballing ideas. To what extent do you think robotics will be that next frontier? Will, will they already are. Um, you know, we, uh, while it's tons of fun to dive to Titanic, mm. and uh, we still got most of our information and most of our amazing imagery by sending out a little robotic vehicle that I piloted down inside the ship and explored around for hours and hours. That was the most fun. So we will have our robotic emissaries that, that go out into environments that are too harsh for us or where they have to go for extended periods of time. The first glimpse we get under the ice of Europa and look at the ocean of Europa, which is bigger than the ocean of Earth, all the oceans of Earth combined, is gonna be a robot. Mm -hmm. You know, the first time we, we look under the ice of Enceladus, the moon of Saturn, that we know now has hydrothermal activity, much like we have here on Earth, that's gonna be a robot. But you that know. requires making one's peace with the fact that it won't be it won't be human eyes, doesn't it? I mean, there's a moment upstairs where you're in, the, yeah, in yeah. the tiny capsule saying, I want to see this with my eyes. There is, and I have that feeling when I'm piloting a robotic vehicle. It still feels like an extension of me. It's your emissary. But when you send a vehicle on its own mission, and it's far away because of the speed of, of light that limits communication. If some, for robotic vehicles operating out at Jupiter or even on Mars, you can have a light delay of 20 minutes, an hour, or whatever it is. So it's gotta be more autonomous. At that point, it kinda takes the fun out of it. Yeah. Nobody wanted to grow up to be a robot. You know? <laughs> they wanted to grow up to be an astronaut. Well, maybe if they saw Terminator. But I know the guys that, that are the people, men and women, that, that build these things. And there's, there's this concept from a book in the 80s called The Soul of the New Machine. The soul of the machine is the people that built it. They put their mind and their consciousness into that thing and then they send it. You know, mm -hmm. So I had a small part of the development of a stereoscopic camera system that's on the Mars Curiosity rover right now, driving around the surface of Mars. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I'm good friends with one of the people on the imaging team and he and I together came up with the idea of, of the selfie. The, not, not, not the selfie, but <laughs> the selfie that it shoots of itself. So they've done 13 of these things now over a period of a five year mission. And it takes its little uh, hand lens imaging camera and puts the arm way out here and then turns it around and shoots a mosaic like that. And it images itself on Mars and then they compile the mosaic, and every single time you see a photograph of the Mars Curiosity rover, it's that shot. It's just in a different place. So here's me at this rock, here's me at this rock, you know. You've harnessed the narcissism of the social yep. media age Exa to electric exactly. robots take exactly. selfies. It's a Philip K. Dick novel. It's a $4 billion selfie. <laughs> But he and I did the math. Every time you do another one, the unit cost goes down. <laughs> so I think, we're, I think we're down to $150 million a shot right now, something like that. And you're here in New Zealand. I'm going to open this up for questions. You're here in New Zealand. You, um, you, you live here part, of, part mm -hmm. of the time. You're here at the moment working. I'm here working. I'm, we're shooting in Auckland, and, uh, and uh, then I'll be back shooting in Wellington in... Uh, uh, March, uh, February, March, April, May of next year. 
And then we do all of our visual effects work here. So there are literally thousands of, of computer artists working in, uh, in Wellington on the, film, the films right now because we're doing Avatar 2, 3, and part of Avatar 4. Mm -hmm. And I'm written through the end of Avatar 5, so that's going to keep me busy for mm -hmm. at least a few more weeks. <laughs> <laughs> like maybe the rest of my life, I don't know. Not that I'm not interested in Avatar, but I am particularly interested in some of the... Um, sort of non-fiction documentary work right. that you've got coming up. There's something coming out of Africa, which seems right. extraordinary, uh, you know, going back to that idea of some of your um, heroines. Yeah, you well, know. this is the ultimate female empowerment story. Um, Maria Wilhelm, who's here, I don't know where you are, Maria, but anyway, uh, she works with me on, on this, and uh, uh, she developed a project with National Geographic uh, called uh, Akashinga which means the brave ones, and it's about a, uh, uh, a group of women who are trained um, by a former SAS guy to be an anti-poaching squad. And they're highly organized, they're highly dedicated, and they're basically just village women from the, from the area in, uh, in Africa, and they go out and they stop the poachers. Uh, and the poachers are carrying, you know, AK-47s mm -hmm. and things like that, and they raid them and they, they take them down in the middle of the night when they're not expecting it, and they... they they get them arrested. And they literally are the brave ones. And it's an amazing story. And so that's a film that, we're, that we've, we've done a short version of it, and we're talking about blowing it up into a, a much bigger thing. Um, we just had a crew um, out on um, a ship that was going up to the Gackle Ridge in, uh, in the um, North Atlantic. It's up in the polar region. And they had a, a small vehicle, a robotic vehicle, from Woods Hole Oceanographic called Nui. Nereus, uh, Nereid under ice. So it's a fiber optic connected vehicle that could run in under the ice flows and go down and, and look at the hydrothermal vents. So I, was, I didn't get to go on that one, but you know we, we had a film crew mm. on there. So that'll get seen on National Geographic. And we just released on Netflix um, a film called The Game Changers, Game Changers yeah. that we worked on for a few years. It was directed by Louis C. Hoyos, who did the Academy Award winning documentary called The Cove about the dolphin slaughter in Japan. And this is about um, athletes, high performance world athletes, top elite athletes who are living, on, uh, who are winning championships on 100% plant-based diets. So it's really about dismantling the sort of male generated marketing myth of, or male focused marketing myth of meat equals protein. Because even doctors fall prey to this idea that you need more protein, you've got to eat meat. Um, well, where, did, where does the cow get the, pro, you know, the protein from mm -hmm. grass? I'm not saying eat grass, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a myth and it gets dismantled so effectively in this film that since the film dropped on Netflix, which has been about three weeks, um, the number of Google searches of plant-based proteins and plant-based uh, meal alternatives has gone up 350%. So you can see it through, you know, 2017, 2018, mm -hmm. 2019, kind of earnshilling along like this, and it goes, mm -hmm. went, curve went vertical in three weeks. And we will, we will talk about that more yeah. tomorrow, I think. Yeah, good, um, good. But I, I would like to leave, we've got five minutes for some questions, if anybody has some questions. Um, and we've got a roving uh, microphone. We do. Um, and before we start, we'd just like to say congratulations to Christine Susick. You have won the guided tour with Mr. Cameron in the exhibition tomorrow morning. So congratulations. Please come and find me at the end and I'll tell you all about it. Thanks. Cool. Thanks, Rachel. I'm looking forward to it. Who's got a question? Somebody young, this young man right here. I saw your hand go up. What was your favorite expedition? My favorite expedition? Yes. I think it was, um, it, it was a, a series of expeditions that we did for a film called Aliens of the Deep, where we went to different hydrothermal vents in the Atlantic and in the Pacific, and we saw just amazing, amazing, amazing animals. And um, it's like where the, where the super hot, superheated water comes up out of, the, out of the, the ocean bottom and it forms these animal communities. Saw so just incredible creatures. You can actually see it. We made a film called Aliens of the Deep and you can see what we saw. And I think you'll see what, we, see what I mean. But you can also, if you go to the exhibit, you can see like some people like this big diaphanous jellyfish that we, we saw mm -hmm. at a place called Lost City. 
Um, we called it the space bagel because we, we didn't know what it was. And <laughs> none of the Russian scientists on the ship knew what it was. We finally tracked it down and it was, it was something that had never been captured and had only been seen once before called Deepstaria Enigmatica, which means deep star enigma. Mm -hmm. So deep star was the submersible that saw it the first time. I saw it the second time. And an enigma is a mystery. They didn't know what it was, and they still don't really know what it is. Ocean life starts to get very interesting the, d the deeper you go. Oh, yeah. It? Yeah, exactly. Sir? Oh. Right. Um, the example is up in your exhibition, which... Very tiny it. sphere. Uh, well, so I don't know, I know how you sat in it. I was in there for about three minutes, and I was pretty keen to get out. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you might not be a good candidate for a deep dive. <laughs> but what about the effects on you? I mean, the, 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 the dive obviously took many hours. Yeah. How long did it take you to recover from that dive? Right. Well, there's two kinds of diving. So there's the kind of diving that's at, at ambient pressure, where your body is balancing the outer pressure by breathing in compressed gas. And in that case, the gas is going into your bloodstream, and it takes you hours to decompress. You can't get the deepest anybody's gone in the open ocean that way is about 1,000 feet, a little plus or minus. Uh, but I was going down to 35,900 or 35,800 feet. So that's, that's what they call one atmosphere diving. So the pressure on you is no different than it is in this room throughout the entire dive unless you're doing something very wrong. And that usually doesn't last very long. Um, what you get is the, is the effect of, uh, of being in a very cramped space, not being able to move. Um, so, you know, you're, you're prone to possible problems like deep vein thrombosis and things like that where you use circulation. So I had to be very fit before I did the expedition. I did a lot of yoga and that sort of thing. Uh, hypothermia, you're separated by a, a three-inch steel wall from water that's about two degrees C. So it's basically almost freezing. And then, of course, the sphere cold soaks very, very quickly, and then you're right up against a cold steel sphere for 11 hours. So you've got to deal with the cold. So temperature modulation is a problem. You start at the surface in the tropics because you're only a few degrees off the equator. It's hot and humid. You get in the sphere. You turn on all your electronics. It dumps all the waste heat from the electronics into the sphere. Temperature goes up. Humidity goes up until you're just about to pass out. Then over the next hour and a half, you freeze. So mm. it's mostly, that's mostly the, the physiological problems associated with it. So we approached that very seriously, and we actually built a simulator that had all of the electronics mm. inside it, and we put it in a freezer, and we did simulated dives, where I had to run the entire dive, run all the electronics, do everything, run a simulated mission for, for nine or 10 hours and have it cold soaked so that I would know when I had to layer up and put my booties on and all that sort of. I put the little beanie cap on because my head was right up against the cold steel. Plus it made me look kind of more like Jacques Cousteau. Jacques Cousteau, yes, I wondered about that. And what, what about afterwards when, when you went back to the surface? Second you're out, you're, you're good to go. Wow. You know, so while you, you come back to the surface, and in, in the case of the Challenger Deep, since it's so near the equator, you pop out sunlight and it's warm and you, you kind of warm up pretty quickly. Plus, you're so excited to tell the guys everything that happened, and you know, so uh, yeah. It, there's, so there's not, it's not like a decompression thing. Like, I mean, there are people that have done dives where they've had to decompress for days to get the gases out of their bloodstream, but that's a different kind of diving. I've done a little bit of that too, not, not, that, not super extreme, but I've done a, a little bit of decompression diving. And, it's kind of a spooky feeling when you know you've got potentially gas bubbles forming mm. in your bloodstream if you come up too fast. Hi, thank you for an amazing talk. Um, I could really feel for your comments about the education system and how you have your kids go to a school where they can learn whatever they want and through that right. kind of learn what they what they need to know. What they need to, yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, the education system in general is not really like that. But education, I can see, is one of the most important things to solve many problems in the future. Yeah. What do you think can, or what do you think needs to happen to actually have more schools do what you see needs to be done for more kids to grow up 
you know, better education system? Well, the, the, you know, the examples are there uh, for alternate educational systems that really work, that have proven results. It's really up to, you know, governments and, and, and parents, uh, probably at, at, you know, like at the regional or at the district level, to really be involved and not just kind of hand their kids off. And I know a lot of parents are involved, but to really take an active role in their school system and to encourage um, educational change. You know, the, the old sitting in straight rows and getting cracked by a ruler process is not conducive to the greatest, you know, uh, creativity and the greatest receptivity mm -hmm. to learning. Kids learn what interests them. I'm, I'm working with a young actor now, he's 14. He doesn't read very well. He had a hard time reading the script. He had to have it read to him. But I started quizzing him about World War II history, which he happens to be an, like an expert on. I couldn't trip him up. I thought I knew what my World War II is. I couldn't trip him up. He said, well, I, I read all that stuff. He reads what he wants to read, you know. But I mean, you know, uh, he could tell you the number of, t of Russian tank divisions at the Battle of Kursk, mm. you know, because he'd read it, because he was interested in it, you know. So. People follow their interests. Um, I, didn't, I didn't finish college, I just followed my interests. I, I, you know, I self-educated in the, in the areas that, that were exciting. Visual effects, um, electronics, uh, mechanical engineering, things like that. So just telling kids that school is not all they have. <laughs> exactly, well I think you encourage the life of the mind, encourage them to read. It's, hard, it's harder these days because obviously there are a lot of distractions with screens and with multitasking on multiple screens simultaneously. Um, but, uh, you know, kids are, kids are natural scientists. They're curious, they wanna know, how does this anthill work? You know, but it, it, it gets discouraged, by, both by their peers and by the, by the you know, adult world around them. It gets discouraged as they get older. And I think it, we just mm -hmm. naturally sort of outgrow that, that phase of our, our life, except for people who go into the sciences. Mm. What were the earliest stories you loved? Hmm? The first stories you loved, do you remember? Oh, they were always fantasy stories, you know, fantasy or science fiction stories when I was a kid. Comic books, obviously, but, mm. but um, Ray Harryhausen was a, an animator. He did Mysterious Island, you know, Jules Verne, and he did uh, Jason and the Argonauts. These are like, people of my generation that are into fantasy filmmaking, they know those reference points because th those are the ones that blew your mind when you were a kid. Now I showed my, my at the time, 14-year-old daughter who loves visual effects, a Ray Harryhausen movie, classic film. You know, Jason <laughs> and the Argonauts. And I was like, how about that fight between the Cyclops and the dragon? She said, Dad, that was the worst CG I ever saw. <laughs> Well, she's seen Avatar, right? <laughs> I was like, honey, it wasn't CG. It was rubber puppets. And the, yeah. no. Anyway. Noel, we have a question on the back here. Sir? Um, oh, I've just got one, one up further up the oh, back. Okay, go ahead. Mark. Sorry. Um, so when you went to the wreck of the Bismarck, what was that like for you? What did you feel? How did that make you feel? That's a really interesting question because, you know, with Titanic, it's a sad place, it's tragic. Um, it has a very kind of, you know, almost, I almost want to say like a bittersweet quality because it, it's a beautiful wreck and, and it's such an amazing story. But you know when you're there at the wreck that the people aren't there. They mostly died, they got up, they all got off the ship. The ship just left, it just went to the bottom. And they all got off in life preservers in water that was basically minus one C. So they lived like 15 minutes, you know, mm -hmm. at the most. So the wreck is not, you don't find human remains there. Uh, for the most, I mean, nobody's ever found human remains there, but, but every once in a while you'll see two boots lying together on the bottom and know that that was a person for a while until they dissolved away. Um, but for the most part, it doesn't have, it, it's, it's not horrific in that way. Bismarck was horrific. It was absolutely horrific because 
uh, and you still don't see bones or human remains because at that depth, the calcium just dissolves away. They just, they just vanish. They vanish out of their clothes, like in a science fiction movie. So you'll see a leather jacket, leather pants, and boots, but there's nobody there, you know. But you know there was somebody there. But Bismarck, you just see what the shells did. You see what happened to it. You, just, you can imagine how horrible it was for everybody on board. The walls were just blown open. The insides of the ship in Titanic, I could go in and follow a, a deck plan, a floor plan, and I could go into a room and see a bed and go into the next room, and I knew who was in that cabin and that cabin mm. and that cabin. You know, it was fascinating. Bismarck looks relatively intact from the outside. When you go inside with the ROV and I'm flying it, I couldn't find a corridor. I couldn't find a floor. It was just a big jumble of, of, of destruction. And the reason is because those armor-piercing shells that weigh about a ton and a half and are going at Mach 2 go through the, the steel and explode on the inside. So all the shells were going off on the inside mm. of the ship. And so you see a relatively intact ship from the outside with these little holes in it. And you go inside and it's, it's just a big junk heap. So you kind of, you, you feel what it must have been like for those, those guys. Yeah, they were, they were the bad guys, but they were kids. They were 17, 18, 19 years old. And, uh, you know, there were 2,000 of them on board that ship. And they just, they just got, you know, destroyed. And so I, I never wanted to go back to that wreck. You know, we, we did our work and we surveyed mm -hmm. it. And we, we actually mm -hmm. were able to shed some light on the history of that battle because there were things that we were able to confirm forensically that had been conjecture for, you know, since, since the war. And that work is fascinating to me, but that wreck's not a place I'd want to go back to. I think we have time for one or two more. <laughs> Lots of questions. You want to just belt it out? Just belt it yeah, out. I'll, I'll repeat it. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm here now, dude. <laughs> my question is, general, uh, which is because you make a lot of great movies, and I mean, you have Thank very you. Uh, success uh, life. I mean, what makes you uh, success? Can you share us um, some? Elements to make you success. Elements of success. Um, well, Terminator Dark Fate just blew a big crater in the ground. So, it, <laughs> and I thought that was going to be a success. So I don't know if you want to be asking me right now. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, look, it's, I think it's the obvious stuff. You got to work hard at it. You know, it's a, you know, the harder you work, the luckier you get. I think, time, I think luck is, it, uh, is not so big a factor as timing, when recognizing an opportunity, when that, that the, the door will, you can open the door and you can go through it, but the door's always moving, and it's gonna keep moving, right? So you gotta know when to go through the door, and you gotta be prepared for the moment when you do. So whatever that preparation is, education, whether you're self-taught or whether, whether you've prepared through university or, or however, um, so you gotta prepare for the moment, you gotta make that opportunity, you gotta recognize it, and you gotta take it. Um, and then you gotta work hard. And you've got to rely on the others around you, but not rely on them. You also have to rely on yourself, but you have to, you have to work well with the others around you and create that team mm -hmm. genius that, that uh, Joe McGinnis talks about. That's more than the sum of its parts. More than the it? sum of its parts, exactly. Yeah, beautifully said. Mm -hmm. So, Good. Uh, naturally, I quite like animals, so I'd like to know what's your favorite animal and why. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, mi I missed the last part. The what so what's your favorite animal and why is that? Uh, well, I always say that the manta ray is my spirit animal, and that's because I have had some kind of amazing experiences with manta rays. I always admired them just kind of their power and their, their beauty. And I recently found out that, that there's some fairly strong scientific indication that they might be the smartest fish, um, which is something that I had always felt. I used to free dive with mantas, and I always felt that they, they knew that you weren't a threat and they, mm. and they could recognize you, and they, it wasn't like looking into the eye of a fish, which is 
obviously you don't get a lot back. <laughs> expression wise <laughs> well, you know. well not to be rude but the smartest fish is that a high bar <laughs> it's a bit damning with faint <laughs> praise right the smartest fish right yeah um, yeah but mantas are, are sentient beings cool. they're, they're pretty amazing and they're just gorgeous you know they're just gorgeous in the way they move and so on just a great piece of sort of bioengineering you know that won't evolve because it doesn't need to you know it's just probably the way it's been for 60 million years. I mean, sharks in general, lasmobranchs in general, they don't evolve very quickly because they're pretty perfect as they are. Mm. Fit for purpose. Yeah. <laughs> These are great okay, questions, guys. So, yeah. Hi. Now, this, this young yeah. lady right here. When did you start your career? Did I start my career? Well, um, I made my first movie in uh, 1984. I wrote the script in 1983, and I was 29 at the time. So that's kind of a late start, if you think about it. Before that, I was a, um, a tool and die machinist, precision machinist. I was a bus mechanic. I was a high school janitor, and I just worked at all kinds of odd jobs. But of course, that's not what I was. That's just how I was paying the bills. I was writing, I was painting, I was drawing, I was creating worlds in my mind and all that. I was getting ready. It's that thing I was talking about. When that door opens, be ready, you know. And I, I jumped through that door with my hands full of drawings and designs for uh, visual effects techniques and things I'd been thinking of for 10 years before that door opened. So anyway, so the, the correct answer is I started my career at the age of 29. Thank you. Hello. Hi. In the event that we are the comet or the meteor, um, where do you see our, our chance of survival? Off planet or underwater? Well. <laughs> well, no, I think we've got to work on the, I think we've, we've got a great planet here to work with and we look out at all the other planets, you know, we're finding thousands of exoplanets but we have no, short of, of the, discovering some new principle in the laws of physics that we've overlooked so far, we're not going to be able to get there. And the planets in our solar system, you've got basically Mars. Rocky worlds, you've got Venus and Mars. Venus is hot enough to melt lead. Mars, you'll die of asphyxiation in seconds, about 12 seconds. So these are kind of shitty planets. We've got a really, <laughs> really good planet right here. We've got a great planet. I mean, it's up there, right? Really close to the top of the great planet list. But we're not acting that way, right? So we've got to we've we've got to work with what we have. Now, I personally believe that that we cannot solve the 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 food all of all the problems are around farming and food and sustainability. I don't believe we can solve them with land-based agriculture. I believe we have to use the oceans. And by use the oceans, I'm talking about the almost infinite supply of nutrient-rich waters that are down 2,000, 3,000 feet down. We need to bring that up into the photic zone and start sequestering carbon with primary production, and we need to move offshore. So all the people that are going to get displaced by climate change, and it's going to be hundreds of millions of people, I think they're going to live offshore. That's my vision. I think that's the answer. I think that, that can be a major factor for us. Uh, in the future. But in the meantime, we've got to improve land-based agriculture a lot. And we've got to change how we consume and we've got to change how we eat and a lot of things people don't really want to hear about. But it turns out human beings are good at change. You know, we're good at adaptation. Just got to hit us hard enough. Mm. <laughs> and we'll change. Thank you. I thought the, um, the latest Terminator movie was great, by the way. What's that? I thought the latest Terminator movie was great. Okay, good. All right, awesome. good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you. We've run over. We're out of time. But please join me, ladies and gentlemen, in thanking Mr. James Cameron. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Noel. That was delightful. Pleasure.